Hi. Today we're going to try and get one of these ring lights up and running and see what the light output actually looks like. Now, the last time we had a play with these PCBs, you recall that I had a bit of an issue with the LED driver chip. So the AL8805, when I powered some of these boards up, a lot of them were drawing as much as the power supply could give to the board. So something had failed internally, and we had to look at some possible reasons why. The primary suspect being maybe some of these capacitors, these ceramic capacitors, which are known to create transients. And we had a look at that in one of the videos, bearing in mind that in that video, I was not using the best probing techniques. So some of the results look worse than they actually were because I had the long ground lead from the scope. Now, since then, I went through every PCB and I found that about 50% of them had failed. And some of them failed in different ways, so some of them just weren't drawing any current whatsoever and just passing all of the power straight to the LEDs. And then some of them were drawing all of the power that the power supply could deliver. And rather than just plug it in and switch it on, to eliminate the possibility of these capacitors causing a problem, what I actually did is leave the switch turned on. I connected this up to the bench power supply and slowly ramped up the voltage on the power supply and I noticed that quite a lot of them were failing at the point where the IC was starting to work. So somewhere around three volts it was suddenly starting to draw lots and lots of current and so that pretty much eliminates the transients that could have been suspicious on this board. So I think where that basically leaves us is either JLC PCB had some problems with some parts that they had delivered or something went wrong in the assembly process. Now I know many of you will be keen to hear what the resolution from JLC PCB was and whenever you place an order on JLC PCB, if you go to your order history, along with each line item, there is a button you can click on that says quality complaint. So I clicked on that button and described the issue that I was having with these PCBs. We had a few messages backwards and forwards just to confirm what the problem was, that there wasn't a problem with their assembly service and it was just a faulty component. And the resolution was that they would send a voucher for the value of those components. And I did check whether there were any other options available, but no, that's the only option that they offer. And I think that's fairly fair. You've got to consider that this is a prototype service and people could complain about all kinds of component failures where actually the fault is with their circuit and not with the component. And there's no way for JLC PCB to go through and check everyone's schematic and layout and make sure that there's no mistakes made there. So I think offering back the value of those components is pretty fair. Now, some of you did mention, you know, didn't they not check the PCBs before they got sent out, that kind of thing. Well, they check the PCBs for connectivity and then the pick and place is all done as per your instruction. And they do optically check it, but they're not going to do an in-circuit test. That requires a whole kind of harnessing that you would have to design and then have to get built. And that kind of thing just doesn't happen for this type of service. If you're getting millions of PCBs made, you would build a test jig that sits at the end of line and probes it in the way that you have described. But that is quite an expense. You do spend a hell of a lot of money on those pieces of equipment that are all automated to do the testing. So for bespoke PCBs like this, where you're having five or ten made, that is not an option. So basically all they can do is pick and place the parts, optically inspect and make sure that all of the parts are placed as per your request and then send them out. Now they do send out a voucher but they don't send out replacement parts. So I did order some replacement AL8805s but in the end what I decided to do was not use these at all. Someone uh, well, quite a few people actually mentioned that they had problems with these ICs, some of them failing randomly. I've just decided not to use these parts at all. Instead, I'm going to try and use these MP2489 LED driver chips. Now, they are pin compatible and they're almost the same. There's a few differences. Let's have a look at the data sheet and just see what those are. So here they are on Mauser, quite a bit more expensive, £1.55 plus VAT each, although they do go down a little bit in volume. But that pack of 40, I think, cost me about £55 or so, so a little bit more pricey. They are made by Monolithic Power Systems, and we can have a look at the data sheet, but you can see that the schematic is exactly the same. There's just a few differences that we do need to account for on our PCB. So the first difference is the input voltage range, so 6 all the way up to 60 volts. So the previous device was up to 36 volts. So if we do see any transients on the input, 
this one is already going to be quite a bit more resilient to that. So all the way up to 60 volts, we're very unlikely to see those kind of voltages. The next difference is with the dimming pin. Now on the AL8805, we had control up to 100% when our analog voltage was up to 2.5 volts. In this case, if we have an input voltage from 0.3 to 2.5 volts, that changes the current from 25% to 200%. So we're going to need to adjust that reference resistor because I think that's easier than changing the analog control voltage. We do need to adjust that so that at 200% we're actually only putting 700 or 800 milliamps into those LEDs. So this data sheet is much better than the AL8805. There's quite a lot of good information in here, but they've got the formula here for setting that LED current. And I've decided to increase the LED current all the way up to 1 amp. I didn't see a huge increase in the temperature, and it gives a little bit of extra light if we need it. So what I'm going to do is use a 0.39 ohm resistor instead of the 0.36. That means that this current drops to about 517 milliamps. But then when we take into account the 200%, if we drive the reference voltage all the way up to 2.5 volts, that gives us just a little bit over 1 amp. So we're going to replace those two resistors with 0.39 and put the two new driver chips on the board. Now I did notice on this PCB, I can't quite tell whether I've ripped off the pad or not on this pin 1. So I'm just going to quickly test that. And no, it looks okay. So it just looks a little bit dull. So we'll clean up these pads, take off the two resistors and put the new ones on. So Chris Ward from Solder King sent us through some lead-free solder to use. And given that this PCB has been assembled fully lead-free anyway, we may as well keep it that way. So let's give this a try. So the first thing to do is to remove the sense resistors. And normally what I do is add a little bit of solder first before actually trying to remove them. So we've done that. And then we can use our fancy Metcal tweezers to remove the resistors. Then we'll clean up the pads with some wick. So a quick test to make sure we've not done anything silly. I've just powered it up and we've got the LED lighting up here. It's drawing 12 milliamps from the power supply. And if we test across the LED pads, we've basically got our incoming supply voltage, which is what we expect. Just check it this side. Yeah, that's fine. So we could connect the DC load, but let's go ahead and just connect up the LEDs instead. So I've just soldered the LEDs on some fly leads, so we'll just check that it's working before we try and put it in the case. Let's just measure the current. Uh, we'll turn on the clamp meter. Now we do need to zero this on DC. And there we go, zero. So let's turn it on and see what happens. So about 0 0.23 amps. That's at, yeah, minimum brightness. Let's increase that up to the maximum. 0 0.95 amps. Slightly less than what I was expecting. Let's just check the other string. So we're at 0 0.95. And what's this one doing? 0 0.97. So a little bit more. There's going to be a little bit of tolerancing with both the reference current, uh, reference voltage, sorry, on the ICs and also those two resistors. But they seem to be working nicely, so let's put it in the plastic chassis. So I've attached the PCBs to the chassis with some self-tapping screws, and these self-tapping screws actually work really nicely into this material. So I may end up using that rather than trying to thread them with M3 threads, which is what I'd planned to do. But I am going to completely change this design as suggested. So the LED boxes are going to be much smaller and separate to the rest of the unit. Probably screwed in so we can adjust the angle. Although, like I said, this has been designed so that at 200 millimeters away, 
that the beam should be completely focused. But those all seem to sit in there quite nicely. Let's try and power it up. So there we go. And we can turn up the brightness. And that is absolutely blindingly bright. Just to compare, I've turned it back down to minimum brightness. And here is our LED ring light. And this is one of those fairly high power ring lights as far as they go. Although they really aren't. Because if we compare them side by side. If we turn up the brightness. You can see just how much it swamps out this LED ring light. And so just to compare, we'll try and find the brightest spot. It's somewhere around there. So that's 13,000 lux. It's got the times 10 on here, so 13,000. Let's attach the new ring light to the microscope. And so once again, we've got the sensor directly under the center of the ring light. And this time we're at 36 thousand looks at the lowest brightness so already quite a lot brighter and then if we increase it up to maximum we are just shy of 130,000 looks and about 115,000 is direct sunlight onto the bench so we're brighter than direct sunlight here let's see what that actually does for our image quality bearing in mind that we've also got the extra separation away from the center of the lens so here we are with the original ring light and this is at maximum zoom. So at this point, this is where the least amount of light is going to be hitting the sensor on the camera. Now bear in mind that this camera has the IMX290 sensor, which is an extremely low light sensor. Um, on other cheaper cameras, you'll get much more graininess than we're seeing here. Also, we're seeing a lot of reflections around the tracers and around the components because the LEDs are so close to the sensor point where the lens is. So I'm going to try and keep everything exactly where it is and swap out for the other ring light. So hopefully I've not adjusted the position of the microscope too much, but this is the new bright ring light on the lowest setting and it certainly looks quite a lot different. There's a lot less reflections, but I think that is partially down to the fact that we've just got the four LEDs, but certainly around the pads and everything, it's a lot clearer as to what's going on. Now, let's see what happens if we increase the brightness. Obviously, the camera is going to make some adjustments, but that's now at maximum brightness. And so I'll just switch between the two again, and we can compare what that looks like. Now, I did used to have quite a lot of trouble working with black PCBs with the camera on, but this is pretty much crystal clear. We can see all of the detail on the actual PCB material, that's quite impressive. Let's try zooming out and see what it looks like with more light reaching the sensor. And there we go, that's really quite nice indeed. Let's turn down the brightness and just see if there's any discernible difference. We can certainly see a little bit of compensation going on there with the camera, but even at the lowest brightness, that's still very, very clear. So I'm really quite happy with how that's turning out. We've got a little bit more work to do actually on the unit primarily to do with the chassis because I really want to make this a lot quicker to print so that we can print it on the highest quality, make it look really nice, but also to get rid of all of that waste material that we were printing in order to just do this in one piece. So I think we're going to redesign this with LED boxes that are individual, much smaller and promoting better airflow, and then print the sides and print this top side so that it's sitting on the bed so we don't have all of that support structure, and then maybe this collar can be a separate part, maybe custom depending on whichever microscope you're trying to fit it to. Now the other thing that I do want to explore is whether there are any other options for the LEDs because although I don't mind spending too much on these really nice Cree LEDs that are super bright and have got a really nice colour output, they are a little bit pricey. I think um, you know the LEDs are coming in at about I think it was $3.22 each or something like that. So once you start adding in the lenses and everything, it can get a little bit expensive. And depending on your budget, you might want to might want to choose a lower cost LED so that the whole thing's a bit cheaper because the actual PCB is really quite cheap. That was coming in at about 5 or $6. Most of the cost was associated with these LEDs themselves. So that's something we're going to have a look at later this week, hopefully. But uh, I'm quite happy with how that's coming out. Let me know what your thoughts are with the performance of these LEDs, whether you think this is even worthwhile or whether you're happy sticking with your ring lights. 
But uh, yeah, leave your thoughts and comments in the comments section down below. So hopefully you enjoyed the video, and until next time, thanks for watching.